All right. Uh, next up is uh, Brendan Higgins, who's going to be talking about KUnit. Yep. Uh, oh, need to put, present. Uh, yeah, so as Ted said, my name is Brendan. I work at Google. I used to work on Server Bring Up at Google, and I also used to work on OpenBMC, if anybody knows what that is. Um, right now, I'm spending all my time working on KUnit, because uh, it actually turns out it took, uh, it's taking a lot more effort than I thought it would. So, <laughs> uh, yeah, so, uh, so first off, I wanted to make sure I remembered to say this. Please interrupt me. Um, this talk is for you. I, you know, I already know what it, like, about KUnit and stuff, so I would much rather talk about what the audience wants to talk about rather than what I think that you want to talk about. <laughs> so I also really, really hate slide decks. Like, I hate the concept of slide decks. So by definition, I think my slide decks aren't very good because I don't think you can make good slide decks. So anyway, um, don't, don't read into that too far. <laughs> so uh, yeah, so, so why, why unit testing? Why KUnit? Um, so I think it's uh, demo time because I think it's best to just let it speak for itself. So, oh, this is fun. I just realized. So I, I can't for some reason mirror my display. So I'm going to have to uh, put, let's see. Okay. Okay, there we go. Cool. So I'm going to have to look at, where did my mouse go? There we go. I'm going to have to look at the uh, monitor on here. So that's going to be fun. Okay. So uh, so, so all, all this is, is I checked out uh, Shua's um, uh, for next branch. Um, so th this, the, the code that's here is going to be available like upstream whenever um, Shoes Branch gets pulled into um, Linux mainline. Can you uh, the font up maybe? Oh, Hello. yeah. <laughs> Let's see. So the people on the, in the third row can actually see it. <laughs> is, it is this good? Can, can everyone read this? Yes, more? You want to be bigger? OK, cool. Um, so the only modification I did is I intentionally went in and broke some code, so that way you can see what a test failure looks like. But other than that, this is just what's in uh, Shua's Linux next. So you can run KNIT like this. I added some extra parameters uh, for setting a timeout and for making it, oops, I, oh, I unbroke the test. <laughs> <laughs> oh, wow. So I, I ran through this ahead of time, and uh, you know I wanted to make sure that I did this problem. So, okay, I'm, I'm going to break it on my side. So, yeah, I, I didn't actually save it in Git. So, I, I'm, I'm just going to break it. You won't be able to see me break it, and you'll just have to trust that. Okay. So, so I, I guess this, this is what happens when I, I kind of asked for this. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> okay. So um, this should fail now. Yes, fails. Okay, cool. So okay, I can't. There we go. We can scroll. Okay. So this is what a failure looks like. You have an expectation failed at this this line. So I'm going to open up this file. Oh wow, dexterity trying to do. On looking sideways. Okay. Oh, need to do them dash p. And then, so um, naming convention I've been trying to uh, promote is it tests a thing. So if if you have a unit test profile, then it's going to test that thing, and then the unit test will be that name dash test. So this, so in this case, it te uh, the syscall test tests um, syscontrol the CTL. There we go. Cool. Um, so if so, if we went back there, it uh, tested line. I think what was it? Three sixty three. Three sixty eight. Sixty eight. 
So we see that there's an expectation here. It calls this function uh, proc do intvec and expects it to return an e intval. So we know that we're looking for a, um, uh, an erno to, to be returned by this, and it's returning the long one. Uh, if we go back to the example, we saw that the number that was printing it out corresponds to e-range. So we can just look for e-range here. And I had already opened it to that line because I intentionally broke it. Is that a B? Well. OK. And if I run the test again, it should pass now. Yeah, cool. So that, that worked out. Um, oh, you know, I need to get rid of this. Let's go. OK, there it is. Close that. Sweet. OK, so I did also record a video just in case my demo didn't work. Um, but I just do basically the same thing, except in a slightly more organized uh, fashion without as much mumbling. So. Um, so how's it different from the testing we already have? I, I think the first thing is it's pretty fast. Um, unlike my demo, the, the tests run pretty fast. All you have, like, right now they're pretty much bound by how fast you can build the kernel. Um, it doesn't depend on user land. I think that was, that was pretty obvious. Um, hopefully it's sort of obvious. Uh, and it doesn't have any external dependencies. And writing a test is no different than writing any regular kernel code because the, the actual test links against the code that's under test. So I think that, that makes it pretty convenient. It means that you can just test like arbitrary functions in the kernel. So uh, in other words, it's unit testing. Um, so I, I debated on including the next section because I don't really want to get up here and preach about like unit testing and like how unit testing is different from other things. I think that if like people want to understand like the, the reasoning behind like why I made some of the decisions that I did. It's probably understand, important to understand, I don't know, you know, there, there's, there's different philosophies for testing, but it would be important to sort of, to understand my philosophy of testing, of, of what unit tests are. So do, do people want to hear about that or do we want to move on to something else? Yeah, hear about it? Okay, we'll talk about it. Um, yeah, so I, I think, so the, the way I like to break down testing, and there's a lot of tests that fit outside of this testing category or testing regime, whatever, um, but I'm just going to say tests can be broken down into either unit tests, integration tests, or end-to-end -end tests. So I'm going to start off with, do people already feel, feel like they're, like, how many people here feel like you know the difference between a unit test, an integration test, and end-to-end -end test? Can you raise your hand? Okay, that's most people. So. I get, huh? Good, yeah, yeah, so maybe we should just move on. So I'll, I'll just run through it really quick then. Um, so an end-to-end -end test, the point is you're supposed to test the entire system under test. From the standpoint of the kernel, I don't think this necessarily means like, you could argue that would be just in testing like an entire application that you have. I think from the standpoint of the kernel, this means you actually boot a real kernel on a real machine, you have some user land programs which directly interact with the kernel and then you test it that way. Um, you're supposed to be trying to emulate what it would look like for a user of your system. Um, so I have an example here of you might, be, you might want to do this by, like I said, just running on production hardware and then trying to exercise some behavior that depends on the hardware, the kernel, and then like the Cisco interface you provide. The idea is you're trying to keep it as close to the production like environment as possible. Um, a unit test is supposed to test things in isolation. So the, the idea is you're, you're, you're exchanging the realism for um, determinism and hermeticity. So your test should be a lot more predictable. They should be a lot faster and easier to understand. And it's a lot easier to write them and maintain them. They should be very, very fast and they shouldn't require any kind of setup. Like when, when I say fast, I mean your, your test should run on the orders of milliseconds. So, um, yeah. And an integration test, the way I think of it is it's just something that's in between a unit test and an end-to-end -end test. Um, it, it does test the interaction between things under certain circumstances. You could write a hardware integration test that just tests how a driver interacts with its hardware. Um, 
but at the same time, you're still trying to keep it as simple as possible. It's not necessarily going to be a realistic environment, et cetera, et cetera. Um, so I have a little Punnett square thing here that compares the different things. So basically, unit tests and end tests are just kind of opposite. Um, the scope for a unit test is very small, which means that in terms of overall coverage, I should have probably specified that the overall coverage you can achieve with all of your unit tests is quite high because you can test functions directly. Um, but the amount of coverage for an individual unit test is going to be quite low because you're just testing a little single unit. Um, they're gonna be really fast. You should have a really high confidence in the individual thing that you're testing. But that also means that you have very low confidence in like the overall system. End-to-end -end tests are the opposite. In an integration test is just a um, trade-off. So KUnit's not a new idea. Um, lots of other people already use unit testing. There's lots of other really, really good examples of unit testing libraries out there. Um, in, in what I've put in uh, what is uh, staged in Linux next, there really aren't any super new original ideas out there. It's all stuff that exists. So I, I don't think uh, I should be awarded for any kind of cleverness in KUnit. It's really just about, uh, if, if I deserve any praise for anything, it's just because of the uh, will that's taken to do it. <laughs> um, yeah, so I, I don't really want to talk about the XUnit stuff. We already looked at an example. If you want to learn more about XUnit stuff, um, there's this really good Martin Fowler article on it. Um, I, I guess I didn't actually use the, define the term XUnit. Do people feel like they know what XUnit is? Yes? Raise your hand. OK. So that's actually no. Um, so XUnit is, is basically just the, it's, it's a really popular style. Um, a framework for writing unit tests. Basically, you have like some setup code that runs before every single test case. You have a collection of test cases. And then after every test, test case, you have some cleanup code that you would like to run um, after every single test case. And it just makes it easier for you to do that. That's the kind of um, pattern that I followed with KUnit. I have a, a better, ex I have an example of that that we can look at if anyone wants to see it. But I think it's pretty self-explanatory. So um, where's KUnit today? Uh, the initial patch set, which includes the ability to define unit tests um, along with individual test cases, and like I mentioned, the setup and teardown logic, um, expectations and assertions, which give you the ability to actually like define the behavior that you would like the code under test to exhibit. Um, assertions are just an expectation that allows you to bail out a test quickly and easily. Um, there's a resource management API. So um, basically, if you're, you know, if you're, if you're writing, if you want to unit test some code, you're probably going to want to um, use resources from other parts of the kernel um, in your part of your test. So it makes it really easy to use resources and not have to care about it. The test case will just clean it up for you. Um, and there's also some tests. So, oh, oh yeah. And also, I think the thing that I, I showed in the example, the, the really pretty light colors, uh, there's, a, there's a test that extracts the key and it results from the kernel. The, the results are, are kernel readable, or human readable um, in the uh, dmessage log. And there's a tool that makes it really easy to, like it parses them out and then displays them in pretty colors. So that's, that's what's up there today. Um, there's a bunch of other things I'm planning on doing, but I'll get to that later. Um, challenges I faced in trying to do this. Um, the main challenge is probably kind of obvious. The Linux kernel wasn't written intending to be unit tested. A actually, the code was pretty good for the most part. I've not found that many instances, like I feel like most of the code in the kernel actually lends itself to unit testing pretty well. Um, the, 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 Linux, like the Linux kernel code actually exhibits a pretty high degree of encapsulation, code sharing, and modularity. And it's pretty actually object oriented, especially in a lot of parts of like the driver stuff. So it, it's, it's actually pretty easy for the most part to find lots of parts of the kernel that are already written well for the, from the standpoint of making it unit testable. Um, 
the, the biggest problem is that dependencies are, are poorly defined between different code modules. So if you want to take a piece of code and unit test it, you, want to, you still want to be able to take all the things that it depends on, but not include every single thing else. And so right now, that means that I have to still build the KUnit test into a kernel to provide all the resources that an individual test actually needs to run. It'd be a lot easier if it was a lot easier and a lot nicer, a lot more hermetic, if we were able to just take the things that we need to run the test, that the test actually depends on. Um, the main problem I found with this is that KBuild represents dependencies in terms of features and not actual code dependencies. Like it's hard to look at a piece of code and say, this piece of code depends on these functions which are defined in these files. Um, if you look at the KBuild, or the, uh, the associated kconfigs, which is where the dependencies are defined, you see that some feature depends on some feature and it's not really an, there's not really an easy way to map those things out. Does, does that make sense? Yeah, so. Um, so as far as where we fit in the, the test paradigm, this is probably pretty obvious. Um, there, we, we already have lots of examples of um, different types of end-to-end -end tests. And I, I don't, I don't want to get like too into this. I, a lot of a lot of the traditional definitions of an end to end test or of a of unit test integration test and end to end test based are based on how much the code knows about the code that's under test and from this standpoint you could actually argue that some of these testing frameworks aren't don't like aren't strictly end to end tests I, I don't want to debate that too much I, I think that based on the, the the criteria I defined here they look a lot more like end-to-end -end tests for the most part. You do have to boot a kernel somewhere. Um, you are mostly interacting with the code through a syscall interface. Um, I, I mean, I think if we're going to try to like stick it in one of these three categories, we'd say most of the things that are there are end-to-end -end tests. Um, I, th I think that KUnit does a pretty good job of, of fitting the definition of a unit tests. And even though there's definitely some overlap between what KUnit can do, what things like KSelf test can do, and the area of integration tests, I don't think there's really like a clear thing that currently exists for doing the integration testing part. So I think that's, that's something that probably needs further thought. Um, please feel fr free to disagree. Yeah. yeah. Sure. Uh, so I'm not disagreeing, but I'm yeah. just adding to it. Um, K self test kind of will fall into because of because of the way there are some modules uh, you mm -hmm. can load and trigger tests. So it's a bunch of um, binaries and shell scripts. Mm -hmm. but I would classify that as a combination of black box and white box. Right. There is some unit tests in there. Mm -hmm. There are some end to end tests. Sure. And like triggering, going and exercising various syscall options, for example. Mm -hmm. So those, those kind of fall into the category of um, black box test that's written by developers, right? right. So you kind of have to do that distance. So they, they have yeah. that, they know what they're testing, they want mm -hmm. to test. And it, in that respect, it's not strictly back black box because the, uh, the, whoever is test author knows the code. Right. So in that respect, it's not strictly black box, in my yeah. opinion, but um, uh, black box with knowledge of the internals, of the, how, the, how the actual code testing. So it falls into that category. Right. Has, so anyway, just a clarification yeah. that um, yeah, it, yeah. it falls into that. Yeah. So yeah. we do need to, you're right, we do need to figure out hmm. with the K unit in there. We need to kind of figure out uh, to, to have a better story, how, do we, how we can increase coverage using yeah. both. Yeah, yeah, um, that, that's a good point. And so that, that's like why, part of why I actually didn't include that in my definitions of what a unit test and to integration test and end-to-end -end test was, is because I didn't want to get hung up on like the white box, black part, box part. But um, I think that's true. So I think there's definitely there's definitely cases where you will you will find appropriate integration testing coverage provided by either KSelf test or KUnit. I mean, for example, KUnit 
has, can run on, um, it should be able to run on all architectures. I've tested it on ARM and x86 and, of course, UML. So it should run on all ar architectures, which means you should be able to use it for hardware integration testing. Nevertheless, KUnit is not currently capable of doing user space integration testing. And so, like, yeah, like there, there's, there's elements of integration testing in both of them. And I think that's partly just due to the nature of integration tests are kind of the in-between thing. But I don't think there is a well-defined story for what are, if you want to be doing that kind of testing, like what, what the procedure should be. So I think that's probably something that needs more thought. Um, what are we planning to do in the future? Um, so I, I need to improve documentation. Uh, I, th I think what I have there is pretty good, but it's also clear to me based on some people who've used it, I've talked to them, I need more documentation. So um, I also have, in the, in the original, I think it was just the first version of the RFC, I, I had some mocking and faking stuff um, so that way you could like fake out hardware or mock arbitrary like functions or like driver classes. Um, I'm planning on getting those out at some point. I've not really decided how to prioritize that. That's partly why I'm talking to you now is I'm hoping I want to I want to see what people are interested in, how I should prioritize things. Um, I also, it's pretty clear that I need to work on the test result parsing. Um, there are still some, some certain cases of, of um, uh, D-message logs from the kernel that it doesn't parse. Uh, it's pretty straightforward to fix, but the main thing is right now the, the scripts I provided assume that you're building and running the kernel with UML. Um, it would, it, it should, I know a lot of people out there want to build and run all their tests on QEMU, and some people have to use them on hardware for various reasons. So I would like to split out the parser so that way you could take your own dmessage log from wherever you get it and parse that and get like nice test results for it. Um, let's see, uh, I, I, also we need to figure out CI CD for KUnit. Um, yeah, I think that's mostly self-explanatory. Uh, things I'm planning on focusing in the near term, if nobody gives me any additional input. Yes, Tim? Yeah. Is there any plan? I thought the first versions of this emitted KTAP. Yes. So it didn't look like KTAP. What? Oh, <laughs> right. Yeah. Um, so, OK. I'll, I'll move my terminal over and I can, OK. So this is the wrong directory. Nope. Oh, yeah. Good? OK, so if we just run the kernel by itself. Oops. This is what it actually prints out into the D message log. Yeah. So yeah, it, it does support tap. So so there are some minor things that aren't really tap conformant. Um, oh well, you can't see it here because if all the tests pass, it actually is. Um, expectations uh, are multi-line, and it doesn't. Uh, so if you see like the directive thing, um, any anything that is a like message coming from the test is supposed to be prefixed with um, that, with the uh, pound sign. Um, the subsequent lines of the expectation don't have that. Um, technically, looking at the TAP standard, if I wanted to put the, according to the TAP specification, the expectation results should actually be added as a JSON payload. I'm, yeah, well, yeah. my yeah, my opinion has shifted on that. I think we had to ignore the TAP specification, and, and okay. I, I even I don't know if you noticed, but I called it KTAP uh, because I think we should just come up with a 
uh, output format that works okay. for us and and do whatever is handy for our own CI systems. Okay. So, well, well, then we need to decide how to represent something like right, that. Right, right. But I we think, need to have those discussions. So. Yeah, because otherwise I need to add a JSON serializer to the Linux kernel. Yeah, so yeah. That's let's gonna not be do really that. popular. <laughs> 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 um, so Tim, are you saying we want to rip out all the tap stuff that you made me add to KSL <laughs> test? <laughs> Okay. <laughs> let's talk. Yeah, let's talk. Yeah. Yeah. Um, yeah so, Hello? so. Um, yeah. I'm sorry. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, I have a couple of feature requests actually. Mm -hmm. So we might uh, make use of KUnit for uh, uh, dynamic tools like KSN and KMSN. Mm. Um, for that, we probably need uh, to somehow capture the DMESC output because. Uh, the tools are printing uh, error reports, and we want, for example, uh, to check that uh, the uh, they are printing uh, good good reports. That uh, uh, everything is is contained, and that we detect the errors, etc. Mm. So uh, this would be handy. And uh, the other thing, um, does KUnit support anything like death tests in GTest? Uh, so that that's that's a feature I have on the way. Um, it's not fully implemented, but it's able to handle uh, seg faults. Um, but I, I would. I, I, it looks like it should be extensible under UML to also handle panics, which is probably the more interesting use case. Um, trying to do that on arbitrary architectures would be harder. Um, but. <coughs> Anyway, so so yes, sort of. It's it's not it's not currently in there, but it's something I'm going to be working on. I see. Okay, and uh, sometimes uh, our tests tend to corrupt the memory, for example, which mm -hmm. is uh, why we're we're testing it. But right. uh, uh, it could be nice to somehow fall back to the uh, to the good state. Yeah. So this is kind of gets back into what I was saying about like K build and. Um, kconfig, it would be nice to just include the, the things that you need, which I don't know, maybe from your perspective, it, that may not be true. But if you can run, if you depend on less code, less non-test code, then that means it's a more hermetic test because there's fewer things that can go wrong. I mean, you could, I guess you could argue that with those other things that if they're not actually being used in the test and they don't matter, but in any case, for the short term, I'm planning on adding a feature to the script, that, that test running script, that allows you to um, boot the same kernel containing multiple tests uh, multiple times and each time run a different selection of tests, which should create a higher degree of herm hermeticity. So at least one failing test suite should not affect another failing test suite. Um, does that? Does that sound kind of what you want? Uh, yeah, probably. OK, cool. Thanks. Yeah. Um, anyone else? Yes. So many of these features and issues are already solved in other unit test frameworks. So mm -hmm. why not work on adapting an existing C unit test framework instead of K unit? Yeah, I thought about that. Um, we, that was, we all think the problems we're solving are unique, but they rarely are. Yeah, no, the, the problems really aren't that unique. Um, so the main reason is, so I looked at something like, I looked at some of the other the testing frameworks that are out there, and they're rather large and are rather unconcerned with the kinds of things that the Linux kernel is doing. Not from the standpoint of just testing arbitrary code, but like um, kernel standards and such. I felt that if, so one of the things I thought was really important is making, all the tests should be written in kernel C that compiles against the kernel, and the test should be in a visible location. Like, I, I think that the test should live alongside of the code that they do test. And I imagine it would, I figured it would be a lot more difficult to try to just convince people to start following like conventions from another testing framework rather than have something that the Linux kernel community can have input on. Um, for example, a lot of other unit testing frameworks assume that they have their own, like they, they get to define like expect EQ and things like that. They, you know, they assume that like everyone's just going to respect the fact that they get to run in the global namespace. And 
that was pretty much the first thing that everyone's like, no, 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 everything needs to be like properly namespaced. So it, it just seemed as though it would be a lot easier to engineer around the problem of getting people to buy into changing conventions and stuff. Does that answer your question? Yeah, I, I think so. It just seems like there should be some kind of partnership or reuse with someone who's solved some of these problems already, even if it's not just adapt their whole framework. Yeah, yeah. Um, that seemed a lot harder, so. But, I mean, if, if you want to do it, I, I won't be opposed. <laughs> Accepting pull requests? <laughs> uh, yeah, yeah. So. Um, yeah. So in the, in the near term, things I'm planning on working on, um, hopefully getting more people to write tests, um, improving documentation, as I mentioned, um, making the things that are already there easier to use. Uh, a couple of people have pointed out things about like the, the test script that I have that are n not perfect. Um, adding tests, getting people to write more tests. And I'm thinking for, in terms of large features, two maybe big areas are working on this mattress API, which is basically something that's, they're, they're like these composable mattress. Like, has anyone used, um, oh crap, what is it called? Expect that, uh, it's, it's, I think it's now in JUnit, but it was originally part of something else. Is anyone familiar with that? Okay, whatever. Um, the, the main thing it was originally written for was for parameter matching for uh, if you have like a mock stub and you'd like to set an expectation on how the mock stub is used, you can use these like matchers in place of parameters to make assertions about how the parameters are passed into this function. Um, after looking at a test that was written recently, it seems as though it might make sense to have it as a standalone thing and not be strictly used just for parameter matching. So maybe that, maybe just mocking. Um, but I, Really, I mean, it's, it's what people think is most interesting. Um, yeah, I we still have, I think, a decent amount of time, another, wait, not 15 minutes. Okay, so I, I had uh, some input on the K-build and dependency uh, thingy. Yeah. At least in the DRM subsystem, we are moving more and more to helper libraries. Okay. And these helper libraries, we, uh, we express them with a, a hidden K-config option, basically, and everything which needs that K-config option selects it uh -huh. instead of depends on. Yeah. Uh, and I think that if you were to do that for more stuff which you want to units test, so if all the base things were sort of becoming libraries at a K-config level which you would select when you need it, yeah. then I you, you are more expressing what you want, basically. I and, think in, and in general, this solves a lot of things like dependency cycles and stuff, so this would be something, work which would be more, not only beneficial for the unit testing, but also. Okay, that, that sounds interesting. Um, yeah, uh, what's your name? Uh, Hans de Goede. How's the hula? Yes. Uh, could, could we maybe talk afterwards? Sure. That sounds interesting. Sure. I mean, uh, yeah, sure. Um, yeah, th um, that flows in. Uh, I was going to point out that config option dependencies that on your next slide, next mm -hmm. steps, if you can go to the next, next one. Yeah, um, on one. that, um, I would add reporting um, and then config. Reporting, uh, report, reporting um, test results, like you know, oh, like CI/CD, right? Yeah, yeah. yeah. So uh, and then also, um, yeah. also the config dependencies, and then so that's probably where we'll be spending mm. a lot of time, based on yeah. my experience with the case self test, getting it to be usable in CI environments. It, yeah. I don't know that if this will be used, but something to keep thinking about. We might need a um, a unified approach. Mm -hmm. um, distros want to run uh, some uh, some of the tests. They're asking, coming and saying, which tests should we run in for this distro qualification? So mm -hmm. we might have to approach this as a unified thing to to come up with the unif so we're not they, we don't have like multiple different ways for each right. each uh, suite. So something that yeah, we have to add. I, I think that. K the uh, like doing something along the lines of case self test fragments. It's unfortunately it seems like some of the. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Sure, sure. Yeah. Capture that as that okay. Okay. Sure. Yeah. Um, yeah. This might be related. Do you have a way, like, say, I want to write a test, and I want to test it with big endian and little endian, mm -hmm. or 
how, you know, uh, I assume yeah. at the moment you just build one config. So you can, you're free to build the test with different configs. But that's sort of external. Yeah, that's yeah. external. That's something you'd have to do. It would be cool if you could sort of have that next to the test. Like, yeah. You know, there, there, there's some other things like that. I realize like, that's super hard. But yeah, yeah. <laughs> there's some other things like that. Like it would also be really nice if you could specify um, a so so I for for like I the original use case was for this was for driver testing because I used to primarily work on on drivers, and um, it would be really nice to be able to specify. Like when you're when you're probing a driver, you want to probe a driver in a particular way. If you could just specify a set, uh, like you know, write a, basically a device tree fragment and say I would like to probe with this device tree fragment. It'd be nice if you could do that in a test. And I think that's a similar kind of thing. Yeah, I mean it's kind of test data or something. Yeah, yeah. But so, it, it, but because of the way it's done, it you have to actually do it at build time with right. you know, the config stuff. Yeah, so, yeah, which is difficult because you yeah. need to know about the test, which happens after config time, yeah. and then use that to configure things. So yeah, that's yeah. that's it's even harder. Yeah, I mean you could um, you could sort of have the configs the test cares about somehow and suck them out and build multiple kernels with those toggled mm. and come up with a like do net, do, you know. do like multiple passes on the build yeah. phase. Yeah, 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 yeah. yeah. Sort of a, it, extension problem. Um. Yeah, I was going to add that one of the things that uh, we did with XFS tests was um, we would actually, after we were done running the test suite, create a test artifact uh, tar.gz that would have the kconfig, all of the test artifacts, you know, including D message output, mm -hmm. so that after you could review the pass fail thing, which might be running you know, somewhere far away from your development system, yeah. you could fetch that test artifact and do the in-depth debugging. And I suspect that having something like that, which was standardized mm. across all the various test infrastructures, yeah. might be kind of handy. Uh, and that's sort of related to that is one of my dreams, which is at the moment, we kind of assume the CI, um, the CI tool actually handles collecting all the test results um, and listing them all. Uh, and the problem with that is that assumes that all the tests are running inside the one true CI system. Uh -huh. uh, and if you have lots of people running your test suites in their own system, yeah. some sort of way of collecting that all, um, and maybe even from desperate test systems, mm -hmm. and then being able to collect it in some standard format yeah. uh, might be really useful. Right, I mean, I actually have my stuff going out in JUnit XML format. So mm. in theory, that could get consumed by some central system with a back pointer to where you could actually download the test artifact um, if you actually cared. Um, and you know, I think that's maybe one of those interesting things. That's not a KUnit specific thing, but just how do we integrate all of our various testing systems yeah. in some bigger, you know, yeah. way of detecting flakes and test failures and whatnot. Yeah, uh, I think Tim has a comment. So yeah, I, a comment, yeah. I, I think we actually talked about this um, the other I'm night. A, at were, were you at the uh, CI uh, BOF? It was like we talked about kernel CI and KCI. Yeah. So I think, I think we talked about this there. And uh, I think we all agreed that, that that would be a nice thing to do. But I think the, the TLDR is that's also really hard. Yeah, work, uh, work, work has begun. <laughs> work, work has begun on that. In fact, I have a presentation I'm giving at the CKI Halfex tomorrow about uh, consolidation of test definitions, and I, I have a couple of slides because I'm that's I have things ahead of it, but a couple of slides on r results formats, uh, standards, and uh, and in other presentations I've given at other events. Uh, also, the notion of packaging results, and we had a discussion yesterday in the BOF about a centralized location for storing artifacts. So stuff is happening, but it's happening relatively slowly. But hopefully, we'll make some progress. Cool. Frank? I've moved on to my tests are now end-to-end -end tests, now that I see your definitions. <laughs> um, more to the point, we talked many months ago about dependency on the scripts that you have to run the test. 
Hmm. And when I run on real hardware as opposed to UML, my real hardware is scripted in my systems. Each different piece of hardware has different boot methods, loading kernels, etc. So it's important to keep the booting a system running the test separate from or, or pull, able to pull it out from your, your generic script. So mm -hmm. your, your script includes creating the system, booting the system, getting the result, analyzing yeah. the result. It'd be real nice if the analyzing the result is also available in a standalone form. Yeah. So when I, in my infrastructure, mm -hmm. I'll have a, a, a log which I can run through that same nice formatting out, out uh, system. Yeah, that, that's that's one of my to dos. Um, Bjorn also wanted something similar because, yeah, it, it's it, this this doesn't really work if you need to run in QEMU or on real hardware. So it's it's definitely a to do. Um, that's what I meant by splitting out the parser thing. Yeah. So any, anything else? Other questions? Yes. My my pitch again on industry standards, but. If uh, the, the, the comment about some of the common results and like the JUnit XML was kind of interesting because if, if uh, you know, the parser has an option to spew it out in some format that other frameworks are commonly using in totally different communities and we could take advantage of other tools for generating analysis and mm -hmm. whatever other types of things other people are doing too because it seems like the people in this community should be focused on solving the problems here, not repeating the problems that everyone else yeah. has already solved. <laughs> yeah, that's probably true. Um, yeah. Okay. Uh, any last questions? We're just about out of time, but we, I think we have time for one last question. All right. Cool. Okay. All right. Let's thank, thank Brendan. You.